and welcome to the 2017 Spring Forum, Day 2. Our session today is Reimagining Higher Education and Workforce Preparation. We are extremely delighted to have you here with us today, and we want to thank you for making the trek through, through, through the fog, and for those of you who were here yesterday, thank you for staying over for our spring conference. Today, we are excited to introduce to many of you and to present to some of you our board chair, Richard Lipsy, who will be bringing you greetings this morning. Will you please welcome Richard Lipsy? I'm so glad to see you here. We had an excellent turnout yesterday, and I see another really good turnout today with a few of you that stuck around to get dosed too. And uh, we will tell you today, try to tell you today, some of the things that the Board of Regents is planning uh, for this year. Dr. Rallo, our Commissioner of Higher Ed, of course, is here with us and will uh, explain to you what uh, Think 30 uh, and the, the next step in Elevate Louisiana. You know, we have to educate our kids and we have to be innovative and we're going to do that. Uh, several years ago when I started on the Board of Regents uh, and some of you, are, uh, uh, a lot of you I recognize, I visited uh, 24 of the 28 institutions in our state and was just uh, discussing with Dr. Geis that, you know, how the condition of some of the buildings on our state and how much deferred maintenance uh, we needed and to bring our campuses back in order. And you today, which I understand are mostly faculty here today, I know you can appreciate that. Great educators are so important to the system in Louisiana and to higher education. But we have to give you buildings to educate in that are not dilapidated, not falling apart, that have chemistry labs where the hoods will work, and uh, scientific labs where the water pipes are not falling out of the ceiling and classrooms uh, where the kids have comfortable chairs to sit in and don't worry about the mold on the ceiling. So it's a myriad of problems that we have in the state of Louisiana, and we really are trying to face all of those problems. And here today, it's so exciting to have faculty members from around the state to come listen to Dr. Rallo and our other speakers today tell you about some of our plans. But we do want feedback. We got a lot of good feedback yesterday. They're going to play the little deal with the polling where you'll get to vote on things today or, or, or put our comments in which we really want your comments. We want to hear what you say. And this afternoon, uh, there'll be a, a whole session on getting your comments on what our plans are. Uh, the uh, legislature has been very specific under Senator Hewitt's bill last year, Senate Bill number 619. They want to hear what higher ed's plans are to increase efficiencies and for us uh, to lay out what we need. And so we have done that. It's been circulated to all of the campuses. And I hope that each of you have had a chance to see that. They will go over a lot more of the details. Dr. Rallo will go over a lot more of those details today. But please give us your feedback. Your feedback is very important. Like I say, we got terrific feedback yesterday uh, and they flash up on these screens and one of the feedback was very interesting it said stay out of our way uh, well we cannot stay out of your way uh, we, we the Board of Regents has a responsibility uh, to coordinate efforts in higher education and we plan on doing that we do have certain authority 
especially aligned with programming and other parts of higher ed that we certainly intend on uh, fulfilling our responsibility and using our authority where we can and recommend recommendations to the legislature uh, on other items that only the legislature can do, and I think you all recognize that. So uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, your, your attendance here, driving here this morning or last night, it is really, really important. Uh, higher education uh, is the basic need of the state of Louisiana right now, and we know we have not been treated fairly. We know we're the lowest man on the totem pole at this point when it comes to funds. We know that you had a cut recently from last year, and now we're looking at a $300 million ballpark cut, mid-year cut for this year, and God knows what for next year. And uh, But Governor John Bell Edwards has made it very plain he does not want to cut higher education. So we're going to do everything we can to give him reasons not to cut higher education. And we can only do that by working together. And we've got four great systems out there and all represented to here today. But like I said, I'm particularly excited that we have faculty here because you are the people in between us and the students. And bottom line, there is nothing more important than the students in the state of Louisiana. And we want to make sure they're well educated. We can do it only with your help. You're the key to it. So we're very appreciative of you being here today. And we're excited to get your feedback. Thank you for coming. So. Really appreciate it. Dr. Vosper, turn it back over to you. Um, before we jump into our fully loaded day, we do have a bit of housekeeping that we need to take care of. So if you would, before we get into our polling and our uh, check-ins, I wanted to just give you some housekeeping. There are a fair amount of you who were not with us on yesterday, so we want you to know that there is coffee stations, and, and it's, it's leaded, coffee. So there are coffee stations in the back corner along with water. We ask you to come fully charged for today, but just in case you need to power up, there are charging stations for your electronic devices in the back, my right hand, your left corner of the room as well. If you need to excuse yourself because we did not build in a break, um, if you need to excuse yourself out the doors, um, through the lobby, and if you look to your um, left, there will be restrooms there for you. And we have staff from the Board of Regents and our um, CCA task force members that have been helping out. So if you have a question, you'll see them uh, scattered throughout the room. We're more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. We also want, for those of you who are going to be participating in our poll, if you have not downloaded the app, please do that. Download the app. You, you, we want to get your feedback, and this is an opportunity for us real time to get your live input and feedback to the questions that we're going to be posing throughout the day. Um, finally, Wi-Fi. For those of you who have not uh, signed into the hotel's Wi-Fi, let me tell you what that is now so that you can log in. The Wi-Fi is going to be I -H, uh, it's Holiday Inn, whichever one it is for Holiday Inn. So when you click the one for Holiday Inn, then you put in the password, which is all lowercase, A-L-X-D-T. Alexandria downtown. A-L-X-D-T is the password, all lower case. Okay? I think that I have pretty much everything except the final piece of business, which was a development that we received um, and had to make a last minute adjustment to our agenda. One of the things that happens when you are planning a conference, um, sometimes the people in the pointy building in Baton Rouge don't 
care that you're having a statewide conference. They have meetings and they call uh, heads of agencies to those meetings, such as the case with our commissioner. He has been uh, called, so we're adjusting the agenda today. The agenda that you have for day two will be slightly amended in order to capture two pieces of the agenda that we really want your participation in and the commissioner wanted to be present for the exchange. So if you would take a peek at your agenda, I'm going to give you some new times so that you can, um, for those of you who need to know where we're going and when we're going to get there and are sticklers for time, I want you to know that the times on your printed agenda are changing. So at 9.15, which is in two minutes, the commissioner will come up and he will be from 9.15 to 10.15. The back end of his um, time will be spent on what was intended to be the 619 discussion this afternoon. Okay, there was a 619 discussion and a faculty panel planned for the afternoon. We are going to bump that time slot at the back end of the commissioner's presentation. So what you'll expect is after the commissioner speaks, you'll have an opportunity to have the open dialogue related to 619 and it'll make sense. For those faculty persons that we reached out to in each system to come in and to be prepared to share, we'd like for you to do that at that time during that, during that period. And that's going to be abbreviated because of the time change. Very next thing, from 1015 until 1120, that hour is going to go by extremely fast. We have a very dynamic speaker from CCA that's going to walk you through game changers and the implications for faculty. At 11.20 to 12 o'clock will be the workforce session, what's work force got to do with it, and that is going to also be a very exciting session. At 12 o'clock to 1.40, we have built in lunch um, so that you can get through the, bu the buffet line and get back, eat, and have a, a speaker. We're doing that from 12 to 140, okay? At 140 to 210, we're doing resources you may not know you have, okay? That will go until 2.10. At 2.10, well, it might be go a little bit longer because I think I'm going to add um, uh, a few of our staff back to answer any lingering qu questions, tie up any loose ends for you during that session. And then I will close out the day on behalf of the commissioner since he's going to have to depart a little um, earlier to make the meeting in Baton Rouge. So we'll keep you posted of those changes. We wanted you to know that we are not disregarding the agenda, but we've had to adjust for it. Okay, I hope everyone's well with that. And now, get your phones out. Poll everywhere, it's poll time. We want to do a check-in, and we have planned some slides just to see who's in the room. So if you would, go to your Poll Everywhere app and identify what type of participant are you. Now, there are several of you who may fit into multiple categories, like our staff member, Harold Butte, who was one of every one of these during registration. <laughs> All right. So majority, Commission C, 66% faculty. What is that? 13% academic and student affairs services. Campus heads are here. Thank you for being here. Sirs and madams, thank you. Legislative staff, um, special guests, business and industry and our agency partners, system reps, thank you very much for being here. All right? Next, let's find out where are you from? So find your logo, click it, and let's see who's here. Checking in from all over the state. Great. I'm going to give you a few seconds to find your logo. 
check in so we can see who's here and where you're from. All right, thank you so much. Now, into which one of these divisions do you fall? Meta majors, and you'll hear more about that today. So we can see who's here. Uh-oh, I think we see humanities twice. So arts, humanities, communication, design, and then we have it again. That's my error, I apologize. Okay, good representation. Great, thank you so much. All right, now, this is the one that is going to really inform the work that we we're, we're have ahead of us today. Can you tell us what you hope or expect to get out of the Spring Forum today? Now, this is uh, open-ended, so you're going to have to type it in. Yesterday, someone got a free lunch out of it. Clarity, understanding, to hear from colleges at my table, great. And, that's, and, and I'm glad someone put that up there. During lunch today, what we hope you will do, and the reason we set you in your meta-major categories is so that you can talk to your colleagues from around the state that are in the same departments with you about activities that you have and implementation and what it means for your departments. Inspiration, useful information, insight. Institutional autonomy, okay. These are some good ones. Innovative ideas to help. We hope we can provide that for you. Go right ahead. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds more. Pathway forward, best practices, you'll get that. Be enlightened. I hope I'm doing that right about now. Clarification for Act 619, you'll absolutely get that. All right, we're going to go forward. So we're at the place now where we invite the Commissioner of Higher Education to the stage. I won't spend, uh, I'm already two minutes, three minutes into his time, so I won't do a formal introduction other than to say that we are extremely fortunate in Louisiana to have um, a leader of higher education who has, whose background spans the gamut. He has come up through the faculty ranks um, from uh, working in the department, being a chair, being a dean, being a provost, being a campus head, and is now a commissioner of higher ed. He also had a very decorated history in the military and came up through the ranks that way. He is very knowledgeable and informed, and his formal bio is on your agenda. Please help me welcome Dr. Joseph Rollo. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Vosper, and, uh, and welcome everybody here. And, uh, I think it'll be a, an interesting time. Uh, today, for those of you who are unaware, and I can't imagine that you're not, today is Groundhog Day, that quintessential American holiday. And for those of you who don't know, Phil did see his shadow, which means that except for Louisiana, we'll have winter uh, for another six weeks. Here, we'll just plant some more flowers. And uh, let me share briefly with you my great failure as a university president. I was so enamored uh, with the concept of Groundhog Day that I tried to restructure the university calendar around Groundhog Day so it would be like Groundhog Day plus 30, Groundhog Day plus 60. Uh, so sadly, that was an endeavor that didn't go anywhere, but I thought it at least brought some, uh, some, uh, some pleasantries to the faculty meetings. Um, I've, I've been here now, I'm starting my third year. It has gone by very, very quickly and uh, in many ways very challenging, but also very frustrating. I, I, I sense and I feel many times what you do. But today what I want to do is first off um, applaud your role on campus, your leadership role in the faculty and, and others. And my, my observations today are really not designed to be negative, but hopefully be provocative and hopefully provide some positive waypoints for you to think about. Because at the end of the day, I always say, we all have the best job. You have the best job. You're paid to think and be around young people and or interesting adults. And there's nothing better than that. But sometimes uh, it becomes sometimes very... Um, uh, difficult sometimes to get through the day. So today, uh, yesterday rather, I focused on uh, student affairs, registrars, admissions, financial aid, and today I'm going to speak to faculty-centered issues. And then uh, my comments will also be tied to our new planning document, which I'll go through, which responds to Act 619, Senator Hewitt, 
and then we'll be able to have some questions and answers. And again, I do apologize for having to leave, but I do have to get back to Baton Rouge, unfortunately. So there's four things I'm going to talk about today. Number one is national trends, what I call our four deep uh, national trends that may or may not affect all of us, but the point is they're out there. And I think we need to be aware of them. Secondly, we're going to talk about specific trends in Louisiana. What is going on in the state in which you work? The third thing is the changing perspective, as Regent, uh, Board Chair Lipsy said, the changing perspectives of the Board of Regents, and then finally challenges and opportunities. So let me start with a quote. And the quote is, I'm going to ask you, what does it mean to be educated? And what is the role of higher education? So I think you can type in some things over there as a good starting point. And you tell me when. Here. What, so what does it mean to be educated and what is the role of higher ed? Let's start with that basic question. Skilled. Independent thinking, critical thinker, being enlightened, able to think critically in a variety of settings, functional adults, Commission back up? Go back? Okay, you can go forward. Now I can go forward? Yes, sir. I'm okay, sorry. technology is our friend, right? There yeah. What is the role of higher education? Okay, and let me quote from Forbes magazine, December 2016. What does it mean to be educated? And what is the role of higher ed? Are our universities institutions of vocational training funded to prepare students for jobs? Or are they institutions whose purpose is something a bit higher than that, perhaps even loftier, or both, or neither? And whatever your answer to these questions, according to Forbes, and I think most of us would agree, we are in the midst of an increasingly rapid transformation in higher education. Technology, social change, and the decade-long trend of ever-increasing cost has left us with multiple challenges, and both, both, most basically the need to be highly innovative in an educational culture that tends to be wary of change. So as Bob Dylan once said, the times they are changing. I'm going to start with a case study here. And as uh, Dr. Vosper mentioned, you know, I ran the table and this is my period of time when I was the university provost. So I want to start with a case study to show innovative ideas that do well oftentimes find themselves in a tailspin when budgets conflict. And I was the provost at Western Illinois University from 2003 to 2007. About 13, 14,000 students, about half the students came from Chicago. Uh, Illinois' higher education system at that time was considered to be one of the top five in the nation. They had 15 institutions. And except for New Jersey, Illinois exported more students for higher ed than any other state in the nation, thus minimizing proliferation of campuses. But other than Chicago, Bloomington, Normal, where Illinois State is, and Springfield, the state capital, Illinois is a very, very rural state. In fact, when they picked me up for my interview and we drove from the airport two hours or whatever, I was introduced to the terms beans and corn, beans and corn, soybeans and corn. That's all you see out there. Very, very interesting. So in 2005, we introduced what was called the cost guarantee. And that cost guarantee said when a student entered the university, he or she would be guaranteed tuition, room and board and fees, everything, for four years. So that, that student could plan because that nothing would change over the course of four years. But two ways were important for that formula to work. The first is that on the entering class, you had to increase the tuition eight to 12%. So if you annualize it over four years, you had a tuition increase of about 3%. So on the incoming class, you had to do that. And secondly, you had to maintain high retention rates because if retention went down in the sophomore year or the junior year, you could not increase any of your tuition or other costs to offset that. So it went quite well. And uh, we, were, we had a great influx of enrollment, not a huge influx, but the point was the institution was positioned nicely. It was doing well. Students had certainty. And then in 2015, 2016, for those of you who follow these sorts of things, you'll recognize that the legislative battle in Illinois between a Republican governor and a Democratic um, legislature went on so that the institutions literally were not funded for a year. And they are still looking, they got a small little check a couple of weeks ago, but they're still going to their second year with no state funding. So what happened at Western Illinois University? 
Remember what I said? You had to have two things to make it work. You had to increase tuition uh, uh, 8 to 12 percent on the first year. But what they did was they discounted tuition because otherwise students were not even thinking about coming down there. So they discounted tuition for the freshmen. And then secondly, because of all the vagaries of the budget, they lost 3,000 students in one year. So retention was down. So what was the result? Faculty layoffs, including tenured faculty. 12-month employees are being paid for 10 months. Anyone who made more than $50,000 in salary took eight days of furlough, and it's not going to get any better. They had to close five programs. In the faculty, it's a collective bargaining campus. Uh, the faculty uh, shared governance is very strong. So they went through the shared governance model, and the faculty said, you can't close any of those programs. It's sacrosanct. You can't touch anything. And the community impact, think about it, it's a small community, maybe 19,000 people, totally dependent upon the universities. Think about home values, all those sorts of things. So the reason I started with that is, as I said, it was a great model in a different era. And the times, as Bob Dylan said, are a changing. So I'm going to talk about four national trends that I think are important. Some of these, all of these, none of these may impact Louisiana, but they are out there and I think that we need to be speaking about them. The first one is the divide of wealth and the emergence of a two-tier system of higher education. In the Forbes magazine, May 2015, this article said more than 70% of faculty are contingent or adjunct compared to 30% in 1975. That is a stark number. The Chronicle just uh, in, in 2016 in June, Georgetown University professor said in 10 years, 10% of the PhDs in liberal arts will be tenured, compared to 30% today. 30% full-time, but not tenured. And 60% basically contingent. But who is immune from those trends? The top institutions. Going back to my point about the divide of wealth. Law school applications in 1999 and 2003 were over 100,000 a year. In 2014, they were less than 55,000. Jobs for lawyers, always seen as safe, are being compressed by international outsourcing to India, for example, and less public sector hiring. The downward trend continued in 2015 with 10% less applications, and the projections for this year are about a total of 49,000 applicants to law school, down from over 100,000. Elite law schools again buck the trend and are seeing even greater numbers of applicants. 50% of the PhD positions in political science in the past decade were filled by graduates from the top five schools, narrowing the concept of open competition, supply and demand. Dr. Bell Whelan, who if never bet Bell, I, I, was, I served on the Sachs board for five years before I came here uh, when I was in Texas, and I learned a lot from the Sachs COC, and Dr. Whelan came out and spoke to us about six, eight months ago, and she had a lot of interesting things to say, but one of the things she said was that nationally, only 28% of university students are the traditional 18 to 22 year old. The rest are adults returning to university, whether two year or four year. Elite campuses are not reaching out to adults. They are basically focusing on that 18 to 22 year old. So once again, the adult learner that has more struggles and challenges is increasingly coming into the public environment and the elite universities once again are being, uh, if you will, uh, not having to deal with those issues. Adriana Kazan, I believe that's how I pronounce her name, professor at USC School of Education runs the Delphi Project. And the Delphi Project says that students who take more classes from contingent faculty have lower graduation rates and are less likely to transfer from two-year to four-year schools. And she also points out, and I think you're probably aware of this, contingent faculty are not very useful for references to grad school because when people look at those grad school applications, they look to see who's recommending you and what's their job. So thus perpetuating again this two-tier system. So compare that to the New York Post article in April of 2015. One of the things that's going on right now is that you have a three to four day, all-inclusive tour to the elite institutions primarily on the East Coast. You get, a, you get a, a plane, you get pilots, you get flight attendants, and they will take you to five to eight elite institutions where they've already set up interviews for you. 
Many of the people bring their own staff. They don't really want to deal with the staff of the, uh, the airplane, the flight attendant. They bring their own staff. So for this experience, three to four days, and apparently it is a wonderful market niche they're in, it, they charge $150,000 for that experience to go visit the elite institutions. And if you looked at Inside Higher Ed just last week, sliding college enrollments, and we're going to come to Louisiana in a few minutes, enrollments are going down nationally, except for elite institutions such as Berkeley and Yale, which have record applications and enrollments. Number two, structural trends. The loss of the higher education monopoly, and I think everyone recognizes a monopoly means there's no competition, so we are losing that. Association of American Colleges and Universities 2015 concludes, students lack applied knowledge, critical thinking, and communication skills. Soft skills are now being defined as going beyond literacy and numeracy to include character, perseverance, sociability, curiosity, and adaptability. Employers have long said the same thing, but now they're doing something about it. Siemens out of Germany has a four-year learn and earn program for apprentices at the wind turbine factory in Charlotte, North Carolina. They graduate with a community college degree in mechatronics, certification from the U.S. Department of Labor, and no debt. The former dean of the graduate education at MIT has just started a new heavily funded institution. No lectures, no classrooms, no majors, and no departments. Students work on tough practical problems, consult the internet, and not faculty when they have a problem. They're called challenge-driven universities. Solve tough problems which have no clear answers. Combines arts, humanities, and sciences, so soft and hard skills, and companies are now sponsoring these students to go through that program. The monopoly that we have is being challenged. The third one, third deep trend. How much longer can the law of supply and demand not apply to higher ed? And the quote, Rising demand for degrees has made universities complacent. And I'll just give you one statistic. 2004, we produced 42,000 PhDs nationally. 2014, last time I could find the numbers, we produced 54,000 PhDs. The Chronicle article in 2016 said people who earned doctoral degrees in the United States last year were less likely to report taking jobs at American higher education institutions than at any time since they've been keeping track. And overall, the job market for doctoral degree recipients remained weak. 28% reported having a job as of graduation, down from 36% just recently. But most importantly, 40% of them said they were taking postdocs at the institution that granted them their doctoral program because there were simply no jobs out there. So the law of supply and demand, I think, is going to catch up. And the last one, two-year and four-year degrees versus lifelong learning. This is from The Economist magazine in 2016. Talking about MOOCs, massive open online courses, they say the enthusiasm has died down. I think probably all of us recognize that. But they point out that, that it still shows enormous potential for delivering education online in bite-sized chunks. Adaptive learning software that tailors courses for each student individually presenting concepts in the order she or he will find easiest to understand, they work at their own pace. It works best where a large number of students have to learn the same material. And this is the point I want to make. Such systems, according to the economists, will not replace faculty, but will allow them to act as mentors rather than lecturers and contingents can be as mentors, as, many, as much a mentor as a full-time faculty member. The rise of artificial intelligence could, like the Industrial Revolution, make it necessary to transform educational practice and with adaptive learning offer a way to do it. During the Industrial Re Revolution, uh, Revolution, employers recognized that a better educated employee was more productive, but they didn't want to train them for fear that they might leave for another employer. This prompted the introduction, as I think we all recognize, of universal state education on a factory model, with schools supplying workers with the right qualifications to work in factories. The old system, a professor at Northwestern in, in Illinois, is saying the old system has to be seriously revised. Since 1945, we have encouraged specialization, so students learn more and more about less and less. But as knowledge becomes obsolete more quickly, the most important thing will be learning to relearn rather than learning to do one thing very well. And he says the education system treats people like clay. Shape it, bake it, and that's the way it stays. 
but we should treat it like putty, which can be reshaped. And lifelong learning versus two and four year degrees, community colleges nationally have been trendsetters and leaders in the use of stackable credentials, adding different certificates to achieve a degree. And universities are now looking at nano degrees, which can be put together a period of time as the need arises. So I, I leave you with those four structural changes. Again, some may affect Louisiana, probably most of them will at some point in time, but have you think about what that context is. And now what I'd like to do, since we are in Louisiana, I do want to give you some specific data. For those of you who know me, um, I think I, I, I try to be as frank and open about uh, sharing information, and sometimes people are aware of the information, but usually people are not. So let me go through. The first one I want to talk about is the budget. It's not all about budget, but obviously budget is important. And here's one of my favorite charts. Some of you probably have placemats. You've seen it so often. But anyway, there are three things I would like you to look at on this chart. The upper left-hand side, you'll see fiscal year 08-09, and you will see total state funds. That $1.5 billion would used to be allocated to the Board of Regents to allocate to the universities. And read to the right of that, you'll see total uh, self-generated funds, about 700 and some odd thousand. That's basically tuition. Now go down to the bottom line, the following line, fiscal year 16-17. State funds have gone from 1.5 billion to 800 and some odd million half. And self-generated funds have doubled. So what that slide shows is that the state portion, all these slides will be online. So if you want to take pictures, that's great, but you can do selfies, but they'll all be online. So what has said basically is that state funding has diminished while we have put the burden of attendance at universities on students. That's the first thing I'd like you to look at. The second thing, if you go to the right-hand side, you'll see a number about $445 million, $445 million in red. And then go down to the bottom line, you'll see that number now is closer to 565 million. These are what are called unfunded mandates. In other words, the state requires each of your universities to give back to the state money to pay for things like pensions, uh, risk, liabilities. We are also funding K through 12 liabilities that are out there. So these are the dollars that go back. So keep in mind, we had 1.5 billion, and we have 700 and some odd million. These are the dollars that go back. And then the last number on the bottom is in red, it says change in nine years. Change in nine years, $364 million. People say, well, tuition has gone up. It's offset the losses. That is absolutely false. The net loss, even with tuition going up, is $364 million. Now we have another question. Here's a question to ask. Of the money that we get, the 800 and some odd million dollars, that we, through the Board of Regents, allocate to the universities, what out of every dollar goes back to the state to pay for those unfunded mandates? You get to, you get to guess. Thirty-two cents, seventeen per. I'm gonna give you ten seconds. Okay, thirty-two cents, twenty-one percent. Fifty-three cents, twenty-two percent. Sixty-six cent, thirty-three percent. Seventy-seven cents, twenty-three percent. Okay, so the answer is sixty-six cents on average out of every dollar goes back to the state. There are campuses that pay even more. One campus I won't mention pays $1.13. That means they have to take 13 cents out of tuition to give back to the state. But go down to the bottom. Remember I said we had 800 some odd million dollars to allocate? Well, back out of that, unfunded mandates that go back. That means the total budget that used to be $1.5 billion is now 230 some odd million dollars. That's what the, we allocate through the Board of Regents right now. And most of your institutions now are having more money coming through tuition than you have through the Board of Regents. And recognize with the failure of Amendment 2, unless we can do something in this legislative session, you have no ability to change and charge more for your tuition. The second one, enrollment trends in Louisiana. Remember what I said about the elites? The elite institutions are getting more and more and more uh, applicants and more and more and more enrollments. This is the line here in Louisiana. For the past three or four years, we have been losing enrollments. We are down, what, about 15,000 students. And so every time I go to the legislature and I see some presidents here, every time they go, they're being asked, okay, why do you have the same size operation 
when there are fewer and fewer and fewer students uh, in the state. There's some other data and enrollment trends. You can see just different ways of presenting, you know, sort of the same information. Uh, this is by completers as opposed to just uh, headcounts by system. This one is an interesting one. It talks about the students that graduate and are they employed in the state period of time out. And as you would expect, as you move from the community colleges to the four years to the professionals, you see you know, more of a drop off in the professions and the four years. What happens oftentimes is that people leave the state after a few years for better paying jobs. Here's one though I think, and we will have a great presentation later on, but here's one that I would like again to commend to your thinking. Um, public higher education is not just all about jobs. We understand that. I'm a Russian history major, as I said before. I, you know, in 1971 when I graduated with a bachelor's, there were no jobs for Russian history majors with bachelor's. But the point is, I learned to read and write and think, and I hopefully coherently and clearly, and I never regret that. But as a public institution, we are increasingly being asked to look at the jobs in this state that are high wage and high demand, and are we aligning our programs? So um, what percentage of good jobs, when we define good jobs, we're talking about jobs with excellent salaries and benefits packages. Out in Lake Charles, for example, process engineering, $75,000, $80,000 a year. So what percentage of these jobs that will be coming open in the next four, five, six years require a four-year degree? Fourteen percent, ten. Fourteen percent said ten percent. Fifty-seven percent said twenty-nine. Twenty percent said forty-six, and nine percent said sixty. Okay. So this is the chart. If you look at it, you'll see that high school graduate, nineteen percent of these jobs will be able to be filled by high school graduate. Two-year colleges, LCTCS, fifty-two percent of the jobs that are opening, high wage, high demands, will require that level of credential. And 29% will require four year and beyond. But it's even starker when we move through this, this next chart over here. Well, let me go. First off, uh, on this chart, we have to talk about the fact that we have a highly undereducated population, as it is. And if you look on the bottom right-hand side, we have to graduate, even, graduate and educate even more people. And that's why whenever I'm asked by the legislature, which is probably on a daily basis, do we have too many institutions, my answer is we need more people coming out. And, and closing things makes no sense when you have this sort of a dramatic gap. But this is, this is the slide that I'd like you to look at. Remember I said, what was the level of education for the jobs that are opening? This one says, what, how many jobs will there be compared to the number of individuals with that credential? And you'll see the red lines are sad lines. For those of you who are accountants, red is bad, right? So the high school graduate, the four-year graduate, and the professional school graduates, all of which, all of whom, will have fewer jobs than people graduating. The only line that has a black number, a good number, is the two-year system. So this is something, again, to think about. I'm not telling you to do anything, but I'm saying think about these things because increasingly for public dollars, which are going down, we are being asked, are we producing the educated workforce, the educated individual, to fill the jobs on the right. And those list down the, on the right-hand side the types of jobs. And they'll be talking more about that this afternoon. Okay, another trend in Louisiana, decreased funding for sponsored programs. And this afternoon we'll be talking about that in terms of the uh, of resources. Sponsored programs, for those of you on every single campus, we're talking about endowed chairs, we're talking about matches for NSF grants, we're talking about a whole host of vital intellectual activity that moves us on the innovate side as well as the educate side. And if you look at the trend line, back in uh, 06, 07, the number is what, close to 
30 some odd million, and we're now down to about 16 million dollars. That has nothing to do with poor stewardship of the Board of Regions, it has to do with the return and a rate of return on investment. So that means as you ask for professorships and as you ask for uh, uh, chairs and as you ask for matches for the National Science Foundation grants, etc., we have less money to allocate, which makes your prospects less competitive. Outcomes-based funding, we got a lot of inquiries about this. Um, this is, an, again, a national trend, uh, and it is, it is with us, it's going to stay with us, and it's going to continue. What this means is that rather than giving dollars out based on how many students you have, part of those dollars are being given out based upon what you are doing with that money. So uh, Senator Pell's legislation said that starting July 1st of this past year, we have to allocate a percentage to outcomes. So this is the formula that we use right now. We have 70% is base. In other words, that means historically what you've had. 15% goes to high cost programs. I'm just picking one. University of Louisiana Monroe's pharmacy school. And 15% goes to outcomes. Now outcomes, Metrics are different for the two-year schools and the four-year schools and the professional school or the non-students uh, non, uh, places like the ag schools and whatever. But a percentage of the funding does go through to outcomes. And I would probably uh, uh, suggest that that number, that outcomes piece, probably will increase uh, in the next couple of years. So where are we? In other words, going back a little bit of time, when I, when I got here in 15 and toward the fall, recognize, and I've said this to some other folks, we really did not have a brand. I'm a former you know, business professor, business dean. There's nothing wrong with marketing. We had no brand for higher ed. Our, our brand was we wanted to reach the average of the SREB. Well, that's nothing that's going to make anybody stand up and, and, and applaud. So instead, we brought in Deloitte. We brought in stakeholders from business and industry, faculty, all the systems, uh, K through 12. And we worked long and hard, and we came up with what you have seen, the Elevate Louisiana, Educate and Innovate. On the Educate side, we talk about a spectrum, a continuum that starts in the senior year in high school and moves through two-year, four-year graduate programs. And every institution lives somewhere on that continuum, so we're all part of a broader concept of higher ed. The second change under Educate was to bring the workforce concept into that. You know, workforce, people say, well, I'm either going to go to college or go to the workforce. I mean, workforce, as you're going to see today, is an integral part of what we all do in higher education. So workforce is really now part of that educate. And on the innovate side, what we're talking about is intellectual property. We're talking about you know, finding the next Gatorade. We're talking about attracting businesses here because of the intellectual capital of our faculty and commercialization and technology transfers. Sadly, as a state, we are not very mature when it comes to commercialization and technology transfer. Some institutions are doing better than others. But basically, this was the Elevate Louisiana that the board passed about a year plus. But then we started to recognize the fiscal realities that I showed you in terms of the, um, of the chart. And what the board said to me and through me, through the staff, said, OK, you need to start thinking differently about planning. And they said, you have two parameters within which to plan. Number one. Don't make believe that you have $1.5 billion to spend or that you're going to go back to $1.5 billion. And the second thing they said was plan initiatives that the board has the authority to implement. The board has been very active over the past years, for those of you who have been around here, and have had all sorts of initiatives out there, but most of them required the approval of the legislature, and it went nowhere. So instead, they said, under the new fiscal realities, you need to start thinking about and going to them, what is it the board can do? And all this stuff is on our webpage and has been for months, if not a year or two. So under the new realities, we have put together um, a series of, uh, of activities. One is to approve revisions to existing role, scope, and mission statements. Number two is to develop and implement a policy on mergers and consolidations. We're not saying that's going to happen, but if somebody wants to do that, there has been no policy on how to do that. Develop and adopt a policy on financial early warning and financial stress. You know, you hear during the session institutions saying they have to declare exigency, which is basically academic word for bankruptcy, uh, and then it goes away. We need to have the legislators understand that many of our institutions are within a whisker daily 
of financial stress. And the board at the December meeting basically identified four institutions and have them come back with a plan to get out of the, uh, the stress where they are at this point in time. Number four, revise the region's policy on low completed review to elevate the threshold for review. Conduct a statewide and regional review of all graduate and all undergraduate programs. We are taking the approach at the undergraduate level. We need to go to where the students are. Access is important, vital. So we want to reach out by maintaining uh, campuses. But at the graduate level, increasingly, as we begin to review things, we are starting to look at you students need to go to the graduate program, and not everyone can do the same thing. And finally, review degree program requirements and courses to encourage structured pathways to degrees. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. So the biggest opportunity, biggest challenge, wherever that crazy Chinese hieroglyphic is, you've got challenges, you've got opportunities. Senator Hewitt in Act 619. That's what I'm going to spend some time on now, and uh, then that's what we can use for the questions and answers. Senator Hewitt tasked us at the Board of Regents to work through basically redesigning the future landscape of higher education for this state. And our staff has been working on this thing, I mean, diligently collecting mountains and mountains and mountains of data. And uh, we gave the draft recommendations to our board. They've been on our website since January. Uh, for those of you who have not been out there, go to the website. You can see this comments, comment period out there. You're welcome to comment. And I'm going to talk about them today and answer questions. And then at our February 24th board meeting, uh, I will present to the board, and the board will decide whether they're going to adopt all, some, or none. Uh, but I, I imagine it's going to be pretty much close to, to all, because we have been working very closely with them. And then Senator Hewitt will get this report back in, uh, in February, and she will then begin to initiate legislation uh, to begin to implement some of the things that the legislature has to do. But we at the board are going to be implementing the things that come within the purview, if you will, of the Board of Regents. So, these are the four that I would like to talk to faculty primarily about. They're on your table, but I'm happy to go on to any, any of these. But these are the four I picked out for, for faculty. So recommendation 1.2, cooperative unification plans. What this means is we're not talking mergers, we're not talking consolidations. This is a term of art that came out of one of the uh, Vermont schools. And it says protect, well this is my own, protect the two most important things for any university. Number one is the name of the institution, and number two is the mascot. After that, everything else is up for conversations. And so what we're saying is, take New Orleans, take Shreveport, and take Baton Rouge. Each of those areas has institutions from all four systems. And each board will, be, if assuming our Board of Regents approves this in February, each system board will, through you, have to come back with a plan. For example, why are all the institutions in New Orleans buying food separately? Do you need financial aid offices at every single institution? Is there a better way of doing it? What about cooperation between police forces? So this is unification and within a region, but across systems. So that's number one, point two. 4.4. 4. This is basically dual credit and dual enrollment. And this is one of the things I want to spend a few minutes on because we have been working a lot on this. And I'm sure everybody is aware of the fact that, again, a national trend is for students to take uh, college credit while they were in high school. In fact, in Texas, where I was before I came here, many of the institutions, not just the big cities, but I was out in West Texas, students would graduate with an associate degree. So, but the, here are the issues. First off, we've done a lot of work, and it's very, very interesting. We work very closely with the Department of Education in the state, and they've been very forthcoming, both with their data, but also they've had some revelations that they were not aware of. So here are the three areas that we need to focus on. Our goal is that a student in the junior and senior year in high school takes 30 credits. And remember, these are SAC CLC transcribable credit. These are not just pieces of paper. They can take them anywhere. Here are the three issues we have to work through. Number one, the quality of the faculty teaching these classes. The best faculty, the best way to teach these classes is for students to come from, your cam uh, from high school to your campus. And a freshman in college looks just like a senior in high school when you sit them together in intro to what or what. 
That's the best way to do it. The second best way of doing it is to have that faculty member from the university, whether it's two or four years, go to the high school and teach the class. The fourth way is via distance, and I'll come back to that in a second. And the third way is to have a high school teacher who has a master's and whatever the minimum number of credits is teach the class. That complies with SACS CLC. But we're talking about a college experience here. And no disrespect to high school teachers, but simply teaching Algebra 1 for 25 years and then coming back later in the afternoon teaching Intro to Calculus doesn't work. But I met with some deans and I met with some provosts over the course of the past couple of weeks, and, and this always comes up. They always complain about the quality of the students that they get coming from dual credit. And my answer to them is, it's your fault, because you're the ones who select the faculty member. Now, let me go through the three problems and come back to some of the solutions. The second issue we also want to talk about as part of this uh, issue is the fact that 30 some odd percent of the students who graduate from high school in this state need remedial English. And close to 50% of the students who graduate from high school in this state need remedial math. We believe that the high schools should fix that before they graduate and go to the workforce or to your institutions. We think and I, that this is their responsibility to do that, whether they do it in high school. Because recognize, we know in the senior year with the ACT cut scores, whether or not the students are going to have to take remedial education. The third one is financing for these courses. And again, I've got a gazillion spreadsheets put together by my staff who are a lot smarter about these things than I am. But I'm a real simple person, going back to my business dean. Is anybody making money on dual credit? And the answer is no. You oftentimes find that a teacher, a faculty member, usually the high school teacher, will get a, maybe a stipend of a couple hundred bucks. Maybe there are one or two institutions that, that, are, uh, that are doing okay. But normally what happens is instead of charging those three credits for the class, you're giving them away. You are literally giving away. Now, you might say, okay, we're giving it away because we think those students then will come to us when they actually go to the university. Another spreadsheet shows that except for three institutions, LSU, ULL, and uh, Louisiana Tech, all other institutions, when they offer dual credit, the students do not go there, by and large. They go elsewhere. So that's not a marketing concept. So here's where it gets interesting. And this is where the Department of Ed has been very helpful. 47% of seniors in this state, in high school, take less than a full course load. Okay, 47%, nearly half, take less than a full course load. But the MFP compensates the high school at the full rate. So what we are saying is that MFP should follow the student. And if the student is taking three credits of college, or six credits, or nine credits, the MFP should pay for that. And I've had principals and superintendents view me as the antichrist when I have said that. But be that as it may, that's what we're pushing for. Rigor, get rid of remedial, and have basically the MFP pay for it. And think about what that would do. You have a one plus one or one plus three. You graduate, and that means you only need one more year for a community college degree, or three years for a four-year degree. And I'll come back to that in a sec. This is the one I think we're most excited about, and you'll hear about it later on. If you require 30 credits of high school credit in the senior year in high school, which we are planning on doing, and at the same time, we know that many of the rural school districts do not have connectivity, that would not be correct to force them to basically have to use distance education, as I mentioned, the fourth method, and when they can't do that. The other thing we found is that we believe we have two groups, and you'll hear from them later on, Lonnie, which are our IT people, and Lewis, which are our librarians. They've been working long and hard over the past months. And we believe that within 18 months to two years, somewhere in there, we will be able to basically do away with textbooks and reduce the cost to a student from $1,500 a year to about $100 or $200. So the student 
will benefit from this initiative. But this initiative also ties back into the 30, because we met yesterday in the room right, or two days ago, the room right over there, through a federal grant and through the governor's office putting up some dollars. We, we believe, and we will believe will be successful, that we will be able to provide connectivity to these rural school districts for zero dollars. That means the students have access to the internet, that means they can take those 30 credits and access via the, uh, the web, the cloud, or whatever it happens to be, the materials. So I thought that's an exciting one. And for college students, it means that their bill goes down dramatically from where they are right now. 5.9. We're looking at TOPS, one of the favorite four letter words that we have. And for those of you who have read through uh, all of the proposals, again, my favorite personal favorite is to sell the naming rights uh, to TOPS. And I think you uh, mentioned the other day, I mean, I'm not just looking to, to somebody to buy TOPS. I want to take the Sesame Street approach where you buy the T is brought to you, and then the O is brought to you by someone else, and the P, and whatever that happens to be. Uh, and again, my favorite is the IHOPS TOPS award. But um, this is what we're looking at. TOPS is a merit-based program. Merit-based program. It is the most luxurious amount of money for the least academic rigor of any program in the country. And so what we are saying is you should graduate in four years. TOPS covers eight semesters. Four years. Less than 40% of students right now graduate in four years who are on TOPS. 60% take five and six years. Here's the issue and here's the dilemma that we have to work with the legislature. In fact, this afternoon, that's one of the things I'm going to be talking to them about. All of you know, or maybe you don't know, but this state is the only one I've found in the entire known universe, and I've done my intergalactic checking, that only allows you to charge for 12 credits. If you take 13 or 14 or 15 or 16, it's free. So I cannot, in good conscience, recommend to my board that we go down that path unless the universities are allowed to charge for those credits. Because right now what happens is that the fifth year and the sixth year, the student is paying tuition and fees. The university recoups because they're getting tuition and fees. But if you now mandate they graduate in four years, remember Amendment 2 failed, you can't raise tuition. So this is something we want to be able to do. We want them to graduate in four years. We want them to basically save money because of the fact that they'll be paying sort of up front. And at the same time, they're in the workforce, so they get a paycheck in the fifth year, in the sixth year, rather than being in school. But we've got to fix that, that issue. Now, one last thing on tops. Remember what I said about one plus one, one plus three. If you graduate with 30 credits from high school and the MFP pays for that, and you're eligible for TOPS. You only need one year of TOPS for a community college or three years for a four year. The Department of Ed has early estimates, early suggestions say that that could free up 40, 50, 60 million dollars a year from TOPS. And my recommendation would be to take that money and put it into GO grants, which are the need based, which are woefully, that's the pronunciation, woefully underfunded. And I think that would be a way of getting into both the adults who are not able to compete for GO grants, but also a lot of other students who have need-based uh, needs. And then the last one over here is um, to work with the business and industry. This is the WISE concept. The WISE concept, which is a great concept, but basically said the universities put up 80% and the state puts up 20% to work with businesses to allow the businesses to contribute even more to uh, produce the types of employees at whatever level, two year, four year and beyond, that they need. And we would like to go back and work with and recommend that the industries are able to work with us, focusing on some of the stuff my colleagues will talk about with the high wage, high demand jobs. So this is now your opportunity to ask me questions about these or any of the ones you have there, or um, I can just, there's a microphone coming over there in terms of that. And we do want to hear from you. We are in the process, as I said, of refining these documents, and we'll go to our board February 24th, and you can either ask now or you can go online and give your inputs. But as I've said, most of these, not all of these, but most of these are within the 
authority, as uh, Chairman Lipsy said, of the board, and depending upon what their decisions on the February 24th, we're going to be move, moving forward with a number of them. Questions? Please. Or have I absorbed all the oxygen? <laughs> and you will fall over. One of my great ideas, remember, El, remember the uh, Elmo dolls? You know, you'd pull, I, I came up with a, I can't make it because I have no talent, but I came up with the concept of elderly Elmo, and he comes with little defibrillators, and so, you know, he gets elderly, he starts, you can hit him, and elderly Elmo comes back. Okay, there we have a first one. All right, in reference to 5.4, uh -huh. bringing down the cost of textbooks, mm -hmm. how does that work at a textbook rental school where the students are only paying $45 per class right. for all their materials? Well, the, the, the question is, how does that work in, in schools that are already currently uh, utilizing a lower course? Our goal is not... Uh, our goal is not to interfere with uh, institutions where it seems to be working. Our goal is to move into at least the late 20th century. I mean, what I hear oftentimes is from legislators, and I'm not saying they're wrong, is why can I go to the library and download on my Kindle all these books and yet my constituents pay $1,800? What we're trying to do is to utilize open source materials, allow access to that for the students, and lower the cost from on average, about $1,500 down to 100 or 200. That doesn't mean other alternatives aren't out there, but we want to give students some choices. Please. I appreciate your comments, and uh, you know, I appreciate you being willing to be in front of us and, and take questions like this. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the metric of finishing in four years. Mm -hmm. I teach in mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. and quite a few of our students, even if they are good students, do take longer than that to mm -hmm. get through, partly due to the rigor of the program mm -hmm. and partly due to other opportunities that they take while they're going through their program. I uh, wonder if you could comment on, you know, things that might be uh, considered sure. in terms of, you know, tempering that four-year requirement sure. based on maybe legitimate concerns. Sure. I mean, first off, I mean, there are programs, for example, um, uh, that require an, a, a four and a half semesters because of accreditation requirements. So we're, we're going to honor all of those things. But let's just go back to your question. I'll give you a specific example. I've been, most of my career has been in engineering schools. I'm not an engineer, but I have a lot of good friends. And, and when I was a business dean, we did engineering management programs. Before I came here, I was the vice chancellor for the Texas Tech University system. And we worked with the engineering school to internationalize. That's my, my background. So here's a specific example. They wanted to do an internship for their engineering students, but they did not want to lengthen the time to degree. So we set up a program in, uh, in South Korea at Hyundai, not the car place, but the, the ships. It was incredible. And the students went over there and they did a four-week internship with Hyundai, and the engineering faculty, not me, the engineering faculty designed it in such a way that it did not increase the time to degree completion. So all I'm saying is it's very possible as long as people are willing to look at what types of experiences they want to bundle rather than simply saying we need to add on time. So I am firmly I believe that faculty are very creative, but what was the theme of my talk? Change is coming. Change is here. So when you think about things, don't just think about adding on a semester, but rather go back, open up everything that's out there, and it's a, you can use Texas Tech as an example. They did not lengthen by one day, but they got that internship experience in there. Please. Oh, there. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I've been asked by one of my colleagues to ask this question. Sure. And it goes... He wants to know why high-paying jobs are the chief focus of what we're trying to do sure. when, in fact, we're, what happens to the nonconformists or the mm -hmm. people who want to be social workers? Sure. Because it seems like that important role of the university providing those kinds of things to the community is being ignored in favor of producing people who are going to get high-paying jobs. And it's a great question. Remember, I prefaced my remarks by saying I was a Russian history major. There were no high-paying jobs for Russian historians with a bachelor's degree in 1971. So I respect that. What we are talking about, though, is we are a public series of institutions. We receive public dollars. And increasingly, we are being asked to provide the educated workforce for the types of jobs that are important to the state. It doesn't minimize the ability if somebody wants to be a social worker, if somebody wants to be a historian. Those jobs are still going to be out there, but we're talking about the allocation of public dollars. And, you know, it gets, and this is where, you know, you're on your campuses. Remember, one of the other things I mentioned was most of your campus, remember that chart, the one that, that had the, the dollars on there? Most of your campuses now have 75 or 80% of your money coming from tuition. 
And if, if those campuses want to focus on other areas, so be it. More power to you. That's a decision for the provost. And as, when I was a provost, and I did this all the time, and people come up and say, I, I mentioned this one the other day because I had never heard this term before, and, and I had to look it up. Say you want to have a degree program in Icarian studies, utopian studies, and you come to the provost. And he or she says, okay, what are you going to willing to put in for it? Is it worth it? I mean, those are the questions you can do at the campus level with institutional money. I'm simply talking about the direction of the limited dollars, and they are getting much more limited from the state level. But if people want to go on, here's the, here's the real dilemma in this state. Uh, again, we're, we're pushing forward, but whether or not uh, we'll ever achieve it, I don't know. Right now, as I mentioned before, universities cannot raise tuition. Not allowed to without two-thirds vote to legislature, which is not going to happen. This next year fee authority, which is only for two years, is going away. So right now, President Geis wants to raise by one penny. He can't do it. What we did in Texas, and before that when I was in Illinois, what we did is we looked at high-demand jobs, high-wage jobs. And when I was a business professor, a business dean at University of Colorado, we doubled, if not tripled, the, cost, the tuition for our business school programs that were high demand. But what we did then was we took a percentage of that, 20%, back for students who were need-based so we weren't pricing them out of the market. That's differential tuition. That allows you to be much more nuanced in how you allocate your degrees and how you allocate your programs. But sadly, in this state, you can't do that. Everything is the same. Tell me when you want me to stop. Okay. Oh, here's one up here, too, right up front. Okay. Uh, he's coming behind you with the microphone. Oh, that's okay. Uh, my, my question is very, very quick. Does sure. anybody track where our top graduates geographically go to work? Do they leave the state or do they stay in the state? Well, that state? chart that I showed you incorporates also, uh, you know, top students and things like that. I think what I can say is that, you know, it's very difficult to track anybody unless they tell you where they're going. But what we do track is basically oftentimes look at, at uh, wages and the types of things like that. So the more education you have, the more you're likely to leave the state after a certain period of time. So I'm just going to make the assumption that most of our top graduates have a four-year, if not beyond. Most of them probably are leaving after five or six or seven years. Please, yeah. If the uh, 30 hours at, at the high school is effective, do you, do you think that that's going to require an increase in tuition? I mean, the Texas factors for those lower uh, undergraduate education is, you know, the lowest, and so that's av averaged into the total funding for the institution. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the MFP, high school paying. Sure, for those sure, three. sure. Yeah. But the tuition then, if you've got students coming in and now you're not offering those classes on campus. Oh, well, I think, you know, I mean, these are your classes. In other words, they're not physically on, they may be on campus. In other words, we're, we're, right now you are offering, not you as a person, but institutions are offering your, I'm just picking one, English 101 as a three credit class, it is being offered to the high school student. What I'm saying is that cost should be the same as if that high school student's on your campus. Not, you should, you're not losing any money. Right now you're losing money. But under the model I'm proposing, you would be compensated at the going rate. So, I mean, you're not losing, and you're not losing students because basically you're gaining some students because of the fact that that year you have students taking those classes. Is it a perfect solution? Maybe, maybe not, but it is, again, a trend that's national uh, and increasing, and uh, what we have in this state is a Byzantine uh, way of doing it. So we're trying to rationalize it, and the word I keep coming back to is rigor. We've got to graduate students who can compete. Here's a, a, a last example. I know we have one more question. Here's oftentimes that you probably don't think about it, but I'm going to share it with you. A high school senior who we know needs to take remedial education and cannot be admitted to a four-year institution can take as many dual credit classes as they want their senior year in high school. So they graduate from high school with 20 credits but they can't get into college. That makes no sense. But that's the reality right now. Well, one last question, I think. There he is. Uh, 
bit of an elephant in the room, but a number of the 619 provisions require faculty buy-in and input. And my concern is that we have data indicating that faculty are very dissatisfied with the current working conditions. Uh, a majority, in fact, 70% would indicate that they would not encourage people to apply for positions in higher education in Louisiana. Uh, a majority of them that, you know, do teach classes that, that, that lead to professional accreditation certification, a majority that do teach skills that reflect the public needs of Louisiana in healthcare, infrastructure, so on and so forth, are actively interested in leaving the state. So my question is, to what extent do they, does the legislature have a plan to address these faculty concerns if they honestly expect things like the provision 619 to attract high caliber candidates to be able to teach at the high school level to uh, address the, remedi the, the remediation problem, uh, as well as the, the college level to address the ongoing needs of the state for the foreseeable future? Well, it's a great question. I can tell you the legislature has no plan whatsoever, and they're probably not very interested. Uh, we do have, I'm trying to find the number in here, a, um, uh, a requirement or a request that we, here we are, create incentives for faculty um, to both remain in the state and to be attracted into the state and to try to be competitive. And we're trying to align some of our dollars support fund so that faculty members uh, at campuses can be recruited and can be retained. So embedded in here is a, a response to exactly what you said. But I can, I can tell you quite frankly that there is no legislative interest whatsoever uh, in, uh, in responding to what, what you've said because they view it as mobility. You don't like it? go somewhere else. It's a sad indictment, but unfortunately that goes to the heart of the issue in this state. And I will close on this, not in a bad way, but I'm just giving you my best uh, opinion, is that higher education is simply not valued uh, in this state. And when you start from that premise, then going to your point about more and more incentives, more and more attractions, it falls on deaf ears. But embedded in here is one of our requests. So again, thank you very much. I think you're going to enjoy the next comments. Hopefully I won't have to use the little elderly Elmo defibrillators on any of you after my comments, but I'll be around for a while too, so thank you. Thank you. I am uh, extremely excited to be able to work with Dr. Joseph Rollo, and I think you see why. <laughs>